I am Alyssa Levis and I'm a product manager at Rover. My preferred pronouns are she, her. So a little bit about me and my time as a product manager. I've been at Rover for coming up on two years now. Rover is a marketplace company where pet owners can come to find great care providers for their fur babies, uh, which is not a term Rover brand actually likes us to use, but um, it really resonates with me. Where owners can find someone to, uh, to care for their pet while they're at work or while they're going on vacation. Um, and where uh, people who really love pets and want to make a business out of it uh, actually help them do that through finding clients, managing their schedules, and um, kind of creating a community of people who love pets. Our historical tagline has, has been that we are the dog people. Uh, recently, uh, we have transitioned to being, uh, we are just pet lovers. It's been really exciting working there. I have been in a part of the business for the two years I've been there called Rover Now, which is a kind of corner of the business where we, our charter is to try to reduce it, the friction as much as possible for owners and providers to find each other. Um, and so, there it's been seeing a product from MVP, uh, minimum viable product, so we just got something out the door. Um, I joined right after that and then kind of the two years of um, learning how to get better product market fit and trying lots of new things and failing and understanding how to scale that product as well. Previously, I have worked at uh, Microsoft in SharePoint in their office org, as well as Yammer, which was an acquisition at Microsoft while I was there and was able to um, kind of work with that team. And then I worked at Facebook before uh, coming over to Rover. And so based on these experiences, I wanted to share with you today my perspective on different approaches to product management um, with the goal of helping you identify and develop your inner strengths. I, it was something that was working for me and how I was thinking about my career. And so this is not necessarily a uh, this is what you should do, though there are some moments where I'm like, this is what you should do. But really, a conversation about it and kind of just an example of how I've been thinking about product. And the other thing is that this is kind of the first time I'm saying a lot of this out loud to other people. So I'm really curious to hear if any of this resonates with you, doesn't resonate with you, um, if it make sense or not. Um, and so I welcome feedback either in this forum or afterward on LinkedIn or my email, which I have at the end of the presentation. So um, our presentation agenda, we are, I'm going to structure this into three parts. The first one is going to talk about what I think makes PM successful and what are the characteristics and of PMs and the approaches to problem solving that are common among what good PMs. Then I'm gonna go into some examples of what I think some of these problem solving approaches look like in real life for PMs who might be who are working in very different areas and kind of types of PMing. And then this last one is around um, how I see my path forward in terms of improving my own skills in different areas and kind of sharing that framework with you all. Then we're going to go straight to the key takeaways before we go in. Um, so I hope you walk away from this presentation with the understanding that um, Every PM job requires a combination of skills, um, analytical, tactical, and design oriented. Um, and they just kind of manifest themselves in different ways. But we each are coming to the table with a particular approach to the world that tends to fall into one of those buckets that's gonna be the inner or innate strength. Um, and so you wanna be able to build that identify it, build it, focus on it, so that you can improve there and also grow to help others. Because that's probably going to be your first opportunities to mentor someone is in that area where it's like, this is just how my brain works. Um, and then finally, making sure that you understand that you can find opportunities to develop particular sk skills at a time. You don't have to challenge yourself in everything all the time. And so, if you ground yourself in the skills that you have, you want to find something that will leverage those skills and challenge you elsewhere, but you don't need to be challenged constantly. 
Um, and an extra bonus takeaway if there are any managers in the room or people who are involved with hiring. Um, I hope that you want to build a well-rounded team of individuals. You might need a particular set of skills for the role that you are hiring, but you want a set of a team of people who think in different ways. And that diversity of thought is incredibly important and will help you and your team build better products. So we'll come back to these at the very end, uh, and then we'll, but we'll start at the beginning. So elements of success for PMs. There's some core characteristics or skills that I think are requirements for any PM, regardless of what you're working on or the size of company that you're in. So with curiosity, good PMs are always asking like, how is this happening? Why is this happening? What is happening? And like understanding the state of the world so that they can then start digging into finding kind of the leverage points of how to change things. You're always kind of looking to find the improvements based on your, under, your curiosity and understanding why things are the way they are today. The other core skill is empathy. We frequently talk as PMs about having empathy for your customers. Um, so I'm not gonna go talk about that much, but I think the really important thing is understanding empathy for the people you work with day to day. Um, product managers, the phrase I have always heard is that we lead by, we, um, we are leaders without authority. Um, no, I, I have never had anyone, sorry, I didn't mean to hit the mic. Um, I've never had anyone report to me. Um, if someone disagreed with me and they're like, no, that doesn't seem like a good project, they could just ignore me and they could build their own project and I'd just be over here in the corner talking into a void. Um, but so having empathy for your coworkers is going to help you be a lot more effective because you want to understand what motivates the people around you and how they like to learn and how they like to think about problems as well so that you can work together more effectively. Empathy for designers looks like having an understanding that they are fundamentally creative people and they want the space to be creative and to have the time to work on things that might not even ever be implemented. Um, and they're not just a uh, kind of like icon factory. And so you sometimes you kind of, need an icon vending machine, and but you, you recognize it when that situation happens, and you say, I know this is not awesome. I'm coming to you with like this incredibly specific request where you have no, there's not a whole lot of like creativity here, but you recognize it going in, and then you make sure that later on down the line, you kind of give that extra space for them to do something in their own, in their own way, because it's gonna be a different approach. And it's, and it's a similar thing with engineering. I've heard a lot of PMs who say like, oh, I don't know how to prioritize technical debt against the product features. I want all of these new features and I want them now. And the problem with that is that it ultimately makes engineers sad. Um, when tech debt accrues over time where you just have little, de little decisions that you made in the past kind of building up over time, um, the code base starts to be a mess and that's really frustrating to work with and it takes longer than it should. And so they're not able to do the kind of work that they like to do. And so you wanna prioritize technical debt work, paying down technical debt along with feature work because it's ultimately gonna speed up feature work down the line. Communication is an incredibly important PM skill. Um, again, when you're leading without authority, you need to be able to talk to people and listen to people and explain what you're doing, why and when, and when things change, why they change, how they change, what it means that they change. There's just like, a, there are a lot of stakeholders that you wanna keep up to date and you need to be able to communicate with them verbally and, and written communication and super importantly, non-verbally as well. And that kind of ties back into the empathy of understanding the situation that you you are going into. Last but not least as a core characteristic is, um, or a core skill is prioritization. In most organizations, PMs are the ones ultimately responsible for making sure that the teams are working on the right thing at any given time. And there are a lot of different factors to take into account. And that's, um, and you have to balance 
you know, how long is this going to take? How much of an impact is this thing going to have? How many other people do I need to do things in order to make this thing happen? And so you have to kind of figure out the right way to sequence things, um, and the prioritization is a huge component of that. So with those core characteristics and skills, one thing that um, I have consciously not included in that basic four is technical depth. Um, so you need to be able to communicate with engineering on your team, but many roles don't actually require that you know how the guts work. Um, and, so, and like, it may or may not be helpful to know how to code something in, the, in order to talk to them. Because a lot of the time, like if you're gonna code, if I'm gonna code something, I'm gonna code something that's like very heavy on the user experience side of things, because that's something that like I, I would understand. But a lot of the engineers I work with are super back end. And so like the language doesn't really kind of come across. Um, you, you need to be able to understand why they are making the trade-offs they are and have them be able, work with them to understand why the implications of different engineering approaches, but you don't actually necessarily need to know the specifics of the engineering approach. Um, I'm a reasonably technical PM in the scheme of things, but also the number of times I use thing or thingy or like I think it's a function class thing it gets the point across. They, like we, we have a shared, over time you get the shared language with the team and so you can piece these things together without actually knowing the difference between a function and a class, which I don't. But so that as a core skill aside, these four core characteristics and skills um, are frequently referred to as soft skills, um, which tends to make them seem less valuable, but they are incredibly valuable. They are just harder to talk about and harder to understand whether and how much you are improving. And they are harder to have a presentation about. And so with that as the foundation, we're going to totally switch tracks and talk about how if you have that foundation, now it's time to think about how are you solving problems? And people solve problems in very different ways. Um, so my, here's the framework. I think that there are three approaches to problem solving, an analytical approach, a design-oriented approach, and a tactical approach. They're kind of a way of describing how you inherently see the world and the kinds of things that you notice. And that's going to really influence the way that you approach your work. So what, what do I mean by having like an analytical mindset or approach? So an analytical mindset and a more analytical person is always going to be asking, what is the impact of this work? Um, that is basically a meme in PM, right? And at this point is like impact, it has to have impact. And that's incredibly important. And understanding how to measure the impact of something is incredibly important. Um, and the, the folks who approach the world with a more analytical perspective are gonna just naturally have an easier time understanding that and knowing how to calculate that. They know what a database schema is and how to perform complex analyses. Analytically minded people in a product development world are going to be drawn to understanding how the data is structured so that they can like dig in and write those queries that are going to help them answer a question. Tools, uh, SQL, Excel, and then programming languages, Python and R, are things that depending on like how deep you are going, there are those tools. Now for the design oriented approach. People who are approaching the world with kind of this design or user-centered perspective are always asking, what is our customer trying to do and why? They're the ones who see the person behind every click and every interaction and every transaction and are going to think about the real human elements of the product. They know what a good user experience looks like and they know that it's rooted in what the customer is trying to do and they can describe that, and they can tell you how your product is not doing that or is doing that and help you make improvements from there. But the kind of, that they are, they feel that experience, they breathe that experience. And as a PM, um, there are specific tools you can use to help you in these things, but these are um, more kind of uh, ways to help your, 
uh, ways for um, design-oriented people to kind of express their the way they are um, thinking about a problem. So customer interviews, user research, wire framing, designs, and personas are all things. Um, a number of these things I will gloss over for you to Google later if that's a thing that sounds interesting. Also, I will say um, if there are questions at any point um, about any of these or you want to dive deeper, let me know. Then for the, tactic, the more tactical mindset, um, they are always asking, how can we get this done more efficiently? Uh, tactical people are trying to always fit the pieces together and trying to create order from the chaos that is software development. Like there's always going to be, seems like we're always saying like, oh, it's really crazy this week. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of just always crazy and that's kind of how it always is. And, that, and a more tactical person is like, I need to impose a structure onto this chaos. These folks are going to be very grounded in the details, and so they're going to be really strong in any kind of coordination, whether it's cross-team or within the team as you're kind of working through um, phases of a project. And the favored tools of a tactical person, tactically minded person, is a go-to-market plan, Gantt chart, backlogs, and really any kind of spreadsheet. These approaches, in addition to being kind of a mindset, are a collection of skills. And there are different skills in each of these buckets that PMs are going to need to develop. And what we really want is to blend all of these approaches and kind of be in the middle of that Venn diagram, pulling from the different skill sets as required by the situation. You're going to need skills in all of these areas, but depending on your role, your company, your um, path in your career, um, the time in the product development process, you're going to have to pull from those different areas. And so while we strive to be this super well-rounded PM that has like, is like fully in the middle and just pulling from everything all the time, these skills being rooted in a particular mindset, some of those skills are going to come more easily to you than others because that's just how your brain works. This is about how my, uh, like, inner PM looks in relation to these skills. I am a super tactical person. Um, I'm really good, uh, which also feels really presumptuous with my team in the room. I'm really good at making sure that T's are crossed and the I's are dotted when it comes to progressing between the stages of a project, um, keeping people in the loop about what the plan is, when it's happening, whether it's changing. Um, but one of the things is that there is a flip side to each of these innate strengths. And with the way I think about the world incredibly tactically, I am constantly working to pull myself out of backlog organization. I need to remember when building the backlogs that like, the sequencing of events is not purely how long something is going to take, but remembering about the impact of something or the reason why we're doing something. And it's not just about like a Tetris style game of people's schedules. And so I have been working to develop my skills in the other areas so that I can over time, hopefully train myself to be slightly less obsessed with spreadsheets. <laughs> As I mentioned, every position is gonna require a different expression of skills. So my first job at Microsoft was heavy on tactical work, which was awesome because that's my inner strength. I was able to kind of have that as a foundation while learning what software development was. Um, and so I was I, working within a familiar skill set, but in a totally new area. And so that was a really good way to kind of get into software development. I wasn't like, ah, I am now a like, very designy PM all of a sudden. I wasn't trying to change everything at once. My subsequent jobs have each emphasized and exercised a different blend of skills that have helped me become more well-rounded over time. I wish I could say this was intentional. It was not. It was, uh, I kind of realized this upon reflection just this last spring when I was thinking about where I wanted to be with my career and the team that um, we're building uh, at Rover, where our team is in our strengths. So given that each position is going to require a different expression of these skills, I wanted to go through some examples of what those skills actually look like. And before I do that, um, I want to note that 
there are some things we talk about all the time in the PM community and that they seem like these are the skills that every single PM needs to have. And that is in particular A-B testing and visual design. There are some jobs, some PM jobs you're gonna have where those are incredibly important and like might feel like literally all you do. And there are other types of PM jobs where those could not be more irrelevant. Um, and so when you're thinking about what it is you want to work on and what skills you want to develop, there, you have a lot of options for that. It's, <laughs> data is the hotness and it's incredibly useful and incredibly um, powerful but so is design thinking. And, you don't, and, you, and I think in some ways, the community is a little bit out of balance in um, kind of the big data sort of thing. Um, though I also really like all the data, so it's, um, you, you just have to kind of understand the, like, the decisions you're making about your career and you, that you have agency in what those are. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about marketplace PMs, otherwise known as search PMs or data PMs. They're the ones who are responsible for the search results on sites you see like Rover or Airbnb and others. As a group, they're gonna bias toward the more analytically minded because of the, incredibly, um, and the incredible depth of quantitative, analytical, and statistical skill that you need in order to be successful in these roles. Um, one of the harder problems they have to solve is understanding something called second order effects, which I'm going to explain with an incredibly contrived example. Um, so imagine we have an arts and crafts marketplace. Sellers post hobby items on the site for a fee and that's how we're making money. Um, and then buyers come and they search for things and then they buy things. And then the sellers get money and the buyers get the thing and everybody's happy and this is great. Um, so that's our scenario. Say I want to search for needle felted animals. Needle felting is a weird hobby I have. Um, and so when I search for this, these are the order, the search results I get. I get a unicorn, an owl, a sheep, and a dinosaur. Um, quick aside, needle felting is when you take wool and stab it a bunch until it gets um, tangled together in denser and denser ways until it can like form these animals. Um, and so I just find that very satisfying at the end of a long day, gonna make a unicorn. Anyway, so I search for needle felted animals and these are the results that I get. And in our system right now, it's incredibly basic um, and we're just sorting it by recency. Uh, when did the seller post this item? Um, that is not great. Uh, that's not how most search results are gonna work. Um, and so say we do some research, at both qualitative and quantitative, and we find out that the number of reviews an item has is incredibly important to the decision about whether you're gonna buy something. It's really like, great. Let's incorporate the number of reviews each item has. So we have kind of this range of numbers of reviews from two to 200. And right now in this system, something with two reviews, this poor little owl is in search result spot number two. But if number of reviews is one of the most important things for our customers in deciding whether to buy a needle felted animal, um, we are serving them the wrong result. And so we're gonna want to reorder it and that owl is gonna go to the end. In the short term, this is awesome. Um, people, we know that people really care about, and in this contrived example, they really only care about number of reviews. And so we are gonna show them based on the number of reviews, and um, they're gonna buy those animals that have high numbers of reviews. The problem is, and where the second order effect comes into play, is that this dude only has two reviews because it's from a new, it's a new seller. It's a new item, it's a new person on the marketplace. It's not because it's just like completely uninspiring such that no one wants to review it. It's like it's been there for a week and this, provide, this um, seller has been there for a week. This new seller is never gonna make it in this marketplace because with this particular situation, over time, we are gonna be just reinforcing the established seller's dominance. And so the big get bigger and then the small 
small new folks never get a chance. And so in the extreme, you have built a, you've made a change that in the short term is going to really increase the purchase rate of your customers because you're showing them the things that they most want at the top. But in the long run, you're not going to have any sellers because no new sellers are going to be able to break into this marketplace where the lamb now has 8,000 reviews. And that's all the search algorithm takes into account. So that's the kind of stuff, the kind of uh, analytical thinking um, that is required of marketplace PMs. And the, there's a ton of data analysis that they have to do behind this to kind of understand what is the magnitude of that impact. So in the extreme example, the marketplace just goes out of business. But it's unlikely that any one change is going to do that. And so you need to understand, like, OK, how bad is it going to be for these new sellers? Are there things we can do to kind of counteract that? One of the things about marketplace PMs is because there is such a need for highly quantitative skills, the idea that you need to incorporate design thinking as a marketplace PM is frequently overlooked. But you actually need a lot of design thinking when it comes to understanding the algorithm. So going back to our marketplace, as it stands today, um, we are taking info about the listings that we have, so recency and number of re reviews, we're putting into the black box of the search algo, which to a marketplace PM would not actually be a black box, but they would really understand that. And then we're getting our search or our ordered search results on the side. One thing that is really common in a lot of search algos is what was what's your past behavior? So what items did you view? How long did you view them? Did you purchase them? Did you purchase again from that same seller? Did you like all of these different things that you can incorporate into the algorithm and then personalize the results? That's awesome if the person has been on the site before. But if you've never been on the site, we have no history for this person. And so we're fully reliant at this point on like how new is this listing? How many reviews does it have? And that is unlikely to yield what people actually want. And so that's where search filters come in. So imagine we add some UI and like UX to the search page so that you can filter, people can choose to filter the results. And um, we have a filter that is like, do you want to look for supplies or a completed item? And it just so happens that like the reason why we ended up with these results is because they are like the most highly rated and they're the uh, they are really new. But there's like this person on the platform that's been trying to sell their needle felting supplies and just hasn't gotten anywhere because all we care about are these like super highly rated things. So when a person can tell us, hey. I actually want supplies, their search results get totally different. So that's what the wool is, and that is a cutoff picture of the needles that you stab with. Um, and so you're going to get totally different results. And so, but you can't just kind of slap a search filter on a page. I mean, I, I guess you could, um, but it would ideally not just be something that you slap on there. There are a bunch of design considerations um, to keep in mind. So. First, like what motivates people to use filters? And like that's a little bit of just a recognition that like, hey, our search algo is never going to be perfect. And we don't, it's not even, it's not worth trying for perfection to read people's minds. People are using filters because we can't read their minds and just kind of recognizing that. So then you get into like what characteristics or categories are important. So like what are you going to filter on and why? What do customers want? What do the different types of things people buy indicate that they want? And do we have that data already, or do you need sellers to give that to you? If you need sellers to give that to you, how do you get them to give it to, give it to you? Is it like when in their process? And so then you're kind of down this whole other path of UX to try to get the data you need in order for the search filter to be able to filter so that we can give you the right results. And so there, there's a long path there. Then there's the question of like what UX to actually use for each filter. So at a most basic level, you could just have like a multi-select checkbox of like I want supplies and 
completed items or I just want supplies or just completed items. Um, but you also see a lot of fancier filters where you ha see color swatches to get like just the purple items or you see a like slider to, in, to show what price range you want and stuff like that. And so you have to make a decision about what is the right experience for your customers at this point um, in their searching and how much, how much are you able to invest in that at this time. And then um, how many filters is too many filters? <laughs> Um, I'm sure you've all had the experience of going to some website and just being completely overwhelmed by all of the different options. And it's like, yes, but I just wanted a coffee table. Like, I, I, it, I want it to be coffee table sized. I don't know how many inches that is, but there's like a coffee table size. And can we just get that? And then, you, and then it's just like you're down this rabbit hole of trying to find just the right filters. And then you get people who are not using filters at all, and then you're back to not having the information that you need. So there's a balance there. So design actually is incredibly important for marketplace PMs. And kind of the tactical element of marketplace PMs is, uh, is managing long running tests. So second order effects are really hard um, to measure and sometimes they're gonna require the tests to run for a long time to get any data on whether that second order effect you were worried about actually happened. And so when you have those long running tests, you are going to want to be able to keep track of it as well as understand what else might have changed in the system while that test is running. So one of the marketplace PMs um, at Rover, she tries to keep a spreadsheet of every medium to major change that has ever happened that could possibly affect search results at Rover. And she tries so that when you are trying to analyze data and you see like all of a sudden something went weird, like two months into this experiment, you can go and look and see, oh, someone turned on this experiment or someone changed this UI. And so there's a lot of kind of just keeping track just so that you can be able to do the analysis that you need to do. Um, I want to talk about what it means to be an internal tools PM. Um, this was not something I actually knew existed until I went to Rover just because I had and never ended up in kind of that part of the org. One of the things that's incredibly important um, in most PM roles is sizing the opportunity, understanding what the impact is. So if you make a change, what is the actual business value that you are going to get out of that change and kind of what's the, ra what's the range of potential business value? Um, and to kind of dig into what that looks like, um, I'm going to talk about um, understanding like where customer support agents are spending their time. Because um, the more time customers are, uh, we have agents spending helping customers, like that, that's literal, like time is money. In one of the things that I looked into as a internal tools PM is how can we reduce costs to serve? Um, which is kind of the primary, one of the main metrics that an internal tools PM might have. Um, at its core, you have, uh, to determine what that is, you have the number of contacts from customers um, or tickets, because it, basically it's a queue system so that you can um, in, know which customers to work with. Um, and then how much time are they spending per ticket? And that, like, with a couple of extra, like, multipliers in there for, uh, how much you're paying per time, all that stuff, that's approximately cost to serve. So when we look at, as we start to dig into what is our cost to serve and how can we potentially reduce that, we wanna first break the data down into meaningful categories. So here is a contrived example where on the x-axis we have time and the y-axis is like time is in dates. And then on the y-axis we have percent of agents time spent. So in a given day, how, is it, how do agents spend their time supporting this product? Um, and we have this giant, giant green thing in the middle. Like agents are spending 40% of their time on something. And we dig in and we find out it's because they're helping buyers find needle felting kits. And you're like, what on earth is happening right now? Right, like you're in, um, you're thinking about uh, needle felting supplies and you're thinking about needle felted completed animals and all of a sudden you're looking in and you realize 
customer support is helping people with something you didn't even know was a problem. So you want to dig in more. We're looking at time spent. The next thing to really look at then is checking against another metric, which is ticket volume. So here, it's kind of the same color-coded system. We see 20% of um, their ticket volume is devoted to needle felting kit helping, which is not the same as 40%. So like this is a, an amount of time per ticket problem. They are spending 20% uh, of their tickets are taking 40% of their time. Could address this as a like handle time issue of like how do we get them through those contacts faster. But also 20% of their time spent helping customers with a feature you didn't know you needed to build in the first place is pretty wild. So before going down any paths, the next thing to do, oh, sorry, there's that. It's still a lot of tickets. You're like, okay, this is a serious problem. And so then you're gonna go and kind of express those design skills, those user-centered design skills in this internal tools context. And one of the things that is really awesome about being an internal tools PM is literally all of your customers are, on, are right there. So like our customer support agents like sit right there or I can, message their supervisor on Slack and ask them questions about how things are going. But so we need to understand what their process is in order to know what isn't working. Um, and so when we do that, we can help, we can at that point make a determination about is it given all the other things going on, should we just help make their flow more efficient so that they spend only 20% of their time on those 20% of tickets? Or should we change the product itself to have like a new listing category for needle felting kits? Internal tools PMs have a lot of collaboration to do. In addition to the collaboration with kind of the product development team of engineering and design and analytics, their customers are right there. And you, it is a huge opportunity and an obligation to work with them on making their jobs easier. So what you don't want to do as an internal tools PM is be like, aha, I see this problem, I'm going to go fix it and come back two months later and just completely mess up all the processes that they have in place. Um, and so you are bringing someone along the process of product development who's usually nowhere near that. And so there's a lot of communication that happens and you are basically every change that you make as an internal tools PM no matter how small, basically has its own go-to-market plan or the equivalent thereof, like a launch plan. So you are making sure, depending on the size of the change, you may actually need to support the team in um, retraining agents on a new flow. Um, but you're definitely gonna need to coordinate the rollout and launch because as much as we don't want to surprise our customers, we really don't wanna surprise our coworkers. Um, and so that's kind of where the empathy comes in as well, where you're doing this coordination with the people whose jobs you're trying to make easier. And you, you want to come in and not just be like, aha, I know how to make it easier, um, but working with them. So now I want to get into um, what my perception is of what successful improvement in these areas looks like over the course of your career. And also just share with you some ways I'm currently working on trying to improve my skills in these areas. So um, starting with the analytical, over the course of your career, you'll be using your analytical skills to ask different types of questions. As a more junior PM, you're gonna ask like, did my changes move the metric? Like, did I do the thing I was trying to do? And you're also gonna um, kind of use your analytical mind and your curiosity to dig into like, why did this metric change when nothing else changed? And just kind of go down the rabbit hole of where did this change and did this part change too? Um, and kind of be able to debug things using um, data. At kind of the mid-level, um, you're looking at trying to understand like how should I change the product based on how people use it today? Um, and so understanding how people use it today and kind of finding the right opportunities within that. Um, and then from a like <laughs> analytical tactical perspective, there's also the understanding that you develop over time of what experiments do you run in what order to learn the most and also have like the greatest effect over time. 
And so that's, that's something that you can develop as you go. And as a more senior PM, you're actually the one that is looking to define the key metrics for the business. So when you are looking at, when you are looking at your area, what is important? How do we measure whether we are delivering on what is important? Um, and you're going to then help your team create goals against those key metrics. And then senior PMs are going to be asking the meta question of like, is that the right question to be asking in the first place? And helping and using their analytical way of breaking down a problem to get at kind of what the right question is. Um, so in the like needle felting example, um, in that case, like the right question is not how do we make this process more efficient. The right question is, why can no one find needle felting kits on our site such that they need to go to support? And so that, that is a like super, <laughs> a very, um, a more basic level quest, uh, way of helping reframe a question that um, more senior PMs are gonna do at a like really high level. Now how I'm Im trying to improve. Um, so I'm trying to do a lot of self-directed learning. In this, I'm not talk gonna talk about like any courses I took or books I read, um, just because I think everybody's learning style is different and mine is not reading books. And so this is just kind of my, my ways of trying to improve. So I ask and try to answer my own questions about usage. So like, how many needle felted animals do people look at before putting one in their cart? How long does a needle felted animal sit in a cart before someone actually purchases it? And then I go try to answer those. And if I can't answer those, I ask people for their, if they have any similar queries that then I can go read and break down and try to understand what it is that they did. One of the other things I have found helpful is mapping out the way the relational database is set up. Not gonna go into details there, just weird. And then also like, I have gotten a lot of help from other people. So when I'm unsure about whether I've done something right, I'm gonna ask for code reviews of MySQL. So there is an analytics team. In addition to doing their own analysis, they are also in a lot of ways there to support others in doing their own analyses. And so, and the more that they can help us help self-serve, the less they have to do in that regard. So I'm gonna ask for code reviews. The other thing I do try to do is, um, even if I don't have any experiments running, um, I ask other people, like, why did you set up your experiment this way? What were the other options you considered? Why didn't you do that? Moving on to um, design-oriented thinking um, and kind of how that career growth looks over, um, or how that growth looks over the course of your career as a PM. A more junior PM is gonna ask, how could this feature's UX be clearer? At the mid-level, um, you're asking kind of what needs aren't being met by our product? Like where are the gaps in our experience? Um, and what is motivating our customers? And at the senior level, it is, um, are we building a cohesive UX across the product? So you're gonna worry about like, does this feature look like it was, came from the same team as that feature? And is that a problem if they're not? Um, and the answer is almost always yes. Um, and then what are the new customer segments we could target? So not just where are the gaps in our current design, in, our, in a given design or feature, but like what features are we not even building? What uh, market opportunities are we not even going after based on what motivates our customers? Um, the way I'm trying to improve in this area, uh, and this is definitely like my weakest area, and so I would say, uh, it is also weakest in like <laughs> knowing how I'm improving or like how to improve. Um, but with my self-directed learning, I've been trying to do teardowns of my product and others. So teardowns are, um, when you're looking at your product, it is usually trying to figure out, like you like look at it with a really critical eye and you're like, what is happening on this page? What is confusing about this page? How does this relate to anything else? Um, and then when you're, but when you're tearing down others' products, you don't have the um, benefit of knowing why certain decisions are made. And so you kind of get to go through the exercise of like, they did this thing. 
why did they do this thing? Do we think this thing is effective? Um, so like, so to uh, take an example, let's say that um, uh, with needle felting, all of a sudden we saw a competitor site make um, their image sizes smaller when it comes to search results. Um, and we're, when we're doing a teardown of that product, it's like, why would they do that? Are, are image, are the image re, is the image resolution bad? Are they trying to target, um, God, this is a bad example. I shouldn't have done it off the top of my head. Teardowns of others' products. Basically, you're trying to understand the motivations behind certain changes, whether you think they are working, and um, how, if at all, you should, uh, you could or should apply that to your own product. Uh, the question was whether it's a form of critique, and yeah, it's, in my opinion, it's a form of critique. I am not sure about the formal definitions of those things. Um, like I said, I have not done a lot of reading up on a lot of these topics, and it's just been kind of just informal conversations and talking to people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's critiquing as well. One of the things that really helps me develop a better understanding of how my customers are thinking and really try to get a gut sense of what, what they are experiencing is reading unsolicited customer feedback. So this can be brutal. Looking at your app reviews, looking at customer support tickets, people, those are bo generally both places where like something has gone wrong. Like some people, like there, there are a lot of like five star app reviews, like with no content in them. But if there's content in an app review, it is usually hard to hear. Um, because that's, that's just how the internet works. But it helps you see like what problems are people having. Um, and so you get more exposure to those problems that will help you form more opinions down the line. And then uh, working with others. Uh, I love asking designer, our designers what other options they considered and why, and why did they not go with that? Um, because that can help me understand, learn more about how they think about what customers are trying to do and what motivates customers and what gets in the way of customers doing what it is they want to do. Um, and also just what good, what best practices are in visual design and UX design. Um, Cause I just put copy on everything. And um, as it turns out, words don't solve every problem. You, it, there are real design challenges there um, and I'm not well equipped right now to do that. Um, and the other thing that uh, we recently did as a team was mapping user journeys. Um, and so what we did here was like, this is a incredibly intense and directed teardown of our own product, basically, where you, they mapped out um, kind of a whole scenario end to end of a customer learning about Rover all the way through that customer um, becoming a repeat customer on Rover. And what do they experience and what is good and bad about that and where do we have opportunities to do that? And that um, helps, help, really helped me kind of get out of my um, rut a little bit and think about things in a different way than again, my, spread, my spreadsheet mode. So tactical, Junior PMs uh, is going to be shipping a feature through the product development process. And basically, as you get more senior, it's going to be more features at the same time, uh, coordinating with more people and doing even more um, communication across teams, across orgs, externally as well. Uh, I know we're running out of time. How I'm trying to improve here. Um, Self-directed here, again, I am trying to just find the content that's around me. Um, what does someone else's functional spec look like? How do other people do their go-to-market plans? Um, what do other people's roadmaps look like and how do they keep those updated? Um, and the other thing I'm trying to do is be really rigorous about um, updating timelines and our roadmap weekly so that um, we always have an idea, uh, an accurate idea of what's coming up. 
And then in terms of working with others, um, one of the things is explicitly ask people what they need from you. When you're doing all this coordination, um, how much time do people need to react to something? And can you incorporate that back into your planning in terms of how long something is going to take? Uh, it's really easy for uh, PMs to think about like, okay, it's gonna take engineering that long, and so that is when we're gonna ship. And it's like, oh no, actually like <laughs> design needed two weeks or six weeks ahead of engineering to do that. And like, so engineering can't start work on this tomorrow. And the customer support team needs three weeks of live training. And so you're not gonna be able to ship until after that anyway. And so really trying to ask people what it is that they need in order for us to kind of be better with our predictability of launching. Uh, and then the other thing that's just like, super important, and this kind of applies across the board, is project and team retrospectives. So um, on a regular cadence and also after like a big project ends, like what went well? What didn't go well? What did we get wrong? What can we learn for next time? So that's been really helpful too. So coming back to our key takeaways, um, there are three kinds of approaches to problem solving uh, in the PM world, analytical, tactical, and design. No one is better than the other. They're just different. And we each kind of have our own instinctual um, connection to one of those. And growing that and nurturing that so you can help others is going to be incredibly important. Um, and then you want to find opportunities that align with the skills that you have and the skills that you want to learn, uh, not necessarily the skills that people think PMs should have, because it's going to look very different in different kinds of roles. And then for the managers in the room, diversity of thought and thought process is incredibly important. And you'll have uh, better products as a result of a well-developed team. So thank you all.